Well, good morning or afternoon or good evening, whichever it's going to be for you. We're continuing our uh, march through uh, our course here, uh, the textbook for criminal law here at uh, Wake Technical Community College for the fall, excuse me, for the spring of 2024 semester, although uh, this will probably be up for a year or two, so you may be listening to it a little bit later. But we're on chapter seven now. We're moving on to analyze some more of the defenses that are available under the criminal law. Uh, we're laying a lot of the groundwork. We're about halfway through the course at this point, and of course we haven't gotten to a lot of the technical uh, crimes that might be committed, the actual laws of criminal law. But in order to properly understand them and how they function, the application of them, you have to understand what defenses exist, how they are charged, how they are broken down, uh, how they are prosecuted. So. We have a couple more chapters to go through. Uh, we're at chapter seven here, which is going to talk about some of the different uh, defenses that are available. All right, having said that, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. And let's uh, first distinguish between a defense that is a bar um, and a, uh, a legal defense. So if there is something that we call a bar, basically there is no trial. A bar says you cannot even have a trial to see if the guy needs to prove something or if he needs to show some factor or show the prosecution is incorrect. All you have to do with a bar is establish that the bar exists and there is no trial. The defendant is released. Now a defense is a little bit different than a bar. In a defense, you might say, okay, the physical acts are present. Um, but there is no state of mind. Yes, I killed someone. No, I didn't do it intentionally. Uh, yes, I took uh, the, the wallet, but I thought it was mine. So defenses have to be raised or proved at trial. And sometimes before, I mean, obviously sometimes if you had an adequate defense and you could explain it to the prosecution and they realized that if they went to trial they would lose, uh, then they wouldn't go forward. But basically, for most defenses, as we're talking about them, you show that, okay, this exists, uh, you prove it at trial, the prosecution is unable to prove beyond reasonable doubt um, that you are guilty, and you go free. All right, so affirmative defenses are typically bars. Now, um, when you use an affirmative defense, uh, it's a kind of a specialized type of defense, but we, we call it a bar. So I, I gave some examples there, and I think it's easier to look at the examples to understand. So immunity. Let's suppose that you are arrested for um, stealing money from a bank. But you can show that you were granted immunity from all charges in return for testimony against the president of the bank. At that point, there's no trial. You simply show that there's immunity, and you're done. Um, uh, a duress and the consent, um, you know, we're going to charge you with assault. Yeah, well, he consented to the assault. We were boxing is a good example of that. Double jeopardy, entrapment, violation of speedy trial. All of those represent affirmative defenses, which essentially operate as bars. Now, uh, let's go to that other slide there. In proving um, a crime, the prosecution has the burden. Um, I, as a defense attorney, I don't have to prove anything about my client. It's completely the responsibility of the prosecution to prove each and every element of the crime. Um, if it's a burglary, and I know I use this uh, charge a lot, but if, if we use the crime of burglary in North Carolina that you broke, that you entered an occupied dwelling at night with the intent to commit a felony therein, if you if the, if the state doesn't prove that this burglary occurred at night, if they introduce no evidence that it introduced at night and they rest their case, and I stand up and I say, Your Honor, I ask for a uh, dismissal of the burglary charge, at least the first degree burglary charge, because the prosecution has failed to offer any evidence that the crime occurred at night. And if that's so, then the judge is going to have to recognize that and reduce it. Um, most of the time, the defendant does have to show affirmative defenses. They're going to have to show these things are true. Um, so there's a little bit more to an affirmative defense than the, the classic immunity. Okay. 
Um, common affirmative defenses. These are defenses that bar prosecution for the offense. Uh, immunity, double jeopardy, statute of limitations. Um, if I can show that these exist, and you notice they have nothing to do with whether I committed a crime or not. The fact that you gave me immunity, the fact that you tried me before, the fact that it's been 10 years since the crime occurred, that has nothing to do with whether I actually committed the crime or not. So defenses that if proved cancel or negate an element of the offense uh, is another one. Defenses that serve as a justification for the act to make it an offense, reasonable force. Defenses that excuse the criminal act, insanity, you know. Um, all of these are common affirmative defense. So uh, immunity is, let's take the first one there that we've been kicking around. Immunity is a pretty rare defense. Now there are kind of two classic types of immunity as we look at them uh, in the broader sense. Uh, these are pretty rare when we're talking about rare types of immunity. We're going to go to the more common types in just a second. There's diplomatic immunity and there's legislative immunity. So what's diplomatic immunity? Um, let's suppose the Russian ambassador to the United Nations or the Russia or the Chinese ambassador to the United States um, is driving his car and he runs over a small child because he's drunk. Blue lights come on, they pull him over. It can be demonstrated that, um, yes, uh, he committed the act of running over the child because he was drunk. You're never going to be able to prosecute him because you cannot charge a foreign diplomat in your country with a crime. And that reason is because that protects our diplomats in Russia and China and Korea and you know Thailand and any other place we have diplomatic relations with. Basically, um, your diplomats are protected because their diplomats are protected. This is pretty rare. You do actually, I I'm, grew up near New York City and you do see it in New York City quite a bit with, with traffic tickets from uh, embassies uh, at the United Nations. And you can see it in DC the same way. But basically, no, you cannot prosecute some, a diplomat who is an accredited diplomat in your country. Then there's legislative immunity. Again, this is pretty rare. Uh, but an elected legislatures are immune when they're actually traveling to or from Congress or the state legislature while it's in session or while they're returning. And this is basically to preserve the idea of democracy. Again, pretty rare. But what are the common types of immunity? What are the ones we see most often? Well, the two most common types we see or what we call transactional immunity and testimonial immunity, or what's called sometimes total immunity or use immunity. Now, one of the things that happens, of course, is when you arrest someone, they have their Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent. You can't compel someone to talk, but sometimes you really need someone to talk. So this Immunity often happens when there's a conspiracy or a larger group of criminals. So what you do is, in a conspiracy classically, when you prosecute someone is, you go after the smallest person you can find in the conspiracy. And you go to him and you say, we want to know about your bosses. And he's, he's going to say, look, you know, if I talk to you, uh, I'm pleading guilty. Let's suppose we're talking about someone who smuggled drugs. I'm, I'm going to plead guilty to smuggling you know, uh, cocaine into the United States. So the way that, um, and so I'm going to exercise my Fifth Amendment rights. So the way that the prosecution is going to get around that is they're going to say, okay, tell you what we're going to do, we're not going to prosecute you. We're going to give you immunity. If you testify against your boss, we will not file charges against you. Um, now sometimes this is total and sometimes it's just testimonial. but um, if the prosecutor says that we will not use what you say against you, then you lose your Fifth Amendment rights. Now, the interesting thing with testimonial or use immunity, okay, because it isn't total, is, you know, a guy says, look, if I testify, you could use it against me. If, and if the prosecutor says, we will not use anything you say against you. Notice they're not saying that they won't prosecute you with other evidence they have. Now, you're not going to get a very cooperative witness this way if you say, well, you, we're not going to use your testimony against you, but we got enough to convict you with other stuff, so here's your grant of immunity. You're not going to get a very cooperative witness. 
So very often they're going to have to go to the total immunity or transactional immunity or complete immunity as it's called. The prosecutor says, okay, testify against your boss, we'll never charge you with anything. That's the total immunity. The testimonial immunity is you testify, we won't use what's said against what you say against you in court. It's not as good. All right, so who gives this immunity? Well, as I said, typically we see this in conspiracy cases or when there's multiple defendants. And very often, if you've got multiple defendants, the only way you're going to get a conviction is you've got to find somebody inside the conspiracy, somebody that you can use against the other. So uh, probably most famously against the mafia um, or organized crime. The, you know, if you've got an organized crime group, and you want to use, say, RICO, the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organization Act, against them. What you really need is you need somebody that's inside. Now, you may have a uh, undercover police officer, but that's going to be pretty rare. Almost all undercover work is using confidential informants. It's about 80% of that. So you're going to have to find someone who's willing to testify against Tony and the rest of the boys, and you're going to have to give them immunity. Now. Usually, you don't want to give immunity for anybody at the top. You want to get the people at the bottom. So you get the, you know, the, the guy who ran the drugs and sold them on the street, not the guy that flew them in for Columbia. Uh, you get the accountant that did the books. You don't get the hitman that you know, killed people. So prosecutors typically will give immunity to the smaller or less involved defendants in order to get to the more serious ones. Um, and very often these can be completely different crimes. Let's go back to our example of the accountant. Organized crime might have an accountant who handles their money for them, but you know isn't involved directly in hitting people or extortion rackets or uh, assassination or selling the drugs. Now the, the accountant might be involved in hiding money from the IRS. So what you'll do is you'll go to the, uh, the accountant and say, okay, we're not going to prosecute you for violation of the tax law, but we, we need to know where this money came from. We need to know when it came in so that we can tie your bosses to these crimes. All right, what's another thing we can talk about? Let's talk about mistake of fact and mistake of law. Um, mistake of law is generally not a defense. So let's suppose in North Carolina, this is a case I found, State versus Dellinger. Um, let's suppose that you are drunk and you say, well, you know, I need to get um, over here. It's several miles. I don't want to drive drunk, but I got a horse. It's not a crime to ride a horse if I'm drunk. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not going to, you know, run somebody off the road. So you get on your horse, you're drunk, and you get caught by the police. Well, guess what? It is not a defense to claim in North Carolina um, that I didn't know it was illegal to ride a horse drunk. It is illegal to ride a horse drunk. And the state of North Carolina in 1985 said so. The case is State versus Dillinger came down in 1985. That's um, volume 73, North Carolina Court of Appeals, starts uh, on page 685. The fact that you don't know the law is not a defense. Now, mistake of fact can be a defense. If you are unaware of, uh, unaware of some critical, critical fact. Now, this is only for some crimes, not all crimes. Most crimes where mistake of fact will operate as a defense are crimes that have a component of mens re or the evil mind. So if you're accused of stealing something, stealing is a bad or an evil act. So let's suppose you're in a classroom and you uh, leave your laptop behind. And your laptop is a uh, Apple. Um, you know, laptop computer. And you come in and there sitting on the desk is an Apple laptop computer. And it's uh, silver and it's got the little Apple logo on it. And so you grab it and you walk out of the classroom. And you get to your car and you drive home and you open up your laptop and lo and behold it's somebody else's, right? Same make, same model, you took it. Could you be charged with a crime? Well, you can, it's a defense, okay? So you could say, look, um, 
I didn't mean to take this. I didn't realize it wasn't mine. It's a reasonable defense. Therefore, if I can prove it, you'll be acquitted. You, your mistake of fact was reasonable. Now, obviously, if it's not a reasonable defense, you know, you're, you have an um, uh, a Apple laptop and you walk in and you see a you know, PC, you know, mini case, separate monitor, separate keyboard, and you say, oh yeah, that's what I had, and you take it. That's not a reasonable defense. You're not gonna, you're not gonna make it. The other time it doesn't operate as a defense is when there's really not an element of mens re or the evil mind. And a classic example here is speeding. I, I've been driving on the road myself, and it might be a 55 mile per hour zone, and I look down and I'm going 65. And I say, oh my God, you know, I didn't realize that. And the blue lights come on. Now, fortunately, that hasn't happened. But if the blue lights came on, I couldn't look at the cop and say, well, I didn't intend to speed. I just didn't look down. I didn't realize I was doing 65 or 70. Um, you know, I was distracted. So, you know, it's a mistake of fact. I didn't mean to. I made a mistake. That's not a defense. Uh, because it's not an element of the crime that you are aware that you're speeding in order to charge you with speeding. All right, let's talk about intoxication. People are very often drunk or high, they're on drugs, when they commit a crime. So intoxication, voluntary. So most of the time when we drink, when we do drugs, whether we're talking about drinking alcohol, smoking a joint, doing a line of coke, uh, ingesting, you know, name your drug, fentanyl, methadone, whatever. You intend to do so. You drink, you take the drug. If you're drunk and high when you commit a crime, it is generally not a defense that you are drunk and high. In very, very rare cases, and I can't say I've ever seen this personally ever in the state of North Carolina, you can say that I was so drunk that I couldn't form the specific intent to commit a very specific act. Um, it's not going to fly for 99.999%. Um, the only time it might be successful is a first degree premeditation. If you can say, look, I was so drunk, even though I voluntarily put myself, I could not have formed the ability to plan or premeditate this crime. Um, it's, it's what we usually call a Hail Mary defense, and that's a term that comes out of football, of course, American football, where you say, you know, uh, it's late in the game, I've got nothing to lose, I'm behind, I'm going to throw the ball up as far as I can and hope that my guy catches it. Again, the general rule for intoxication, if you voluntarily drink, take drugs, whatever we're talking about, not a defense, won't operate as a defense. Now, involuntary intoxication is different. Now, um, this defense says, um, I didn't know I was taking a drug that was going to affect my abilities, or I didn't know I was ingesting alcohol. Now, again, for this to work, you have to be charged with a crime that requires a guilty mind. It's not a defense to say, oh, I formed the intent to commit the crime and then I got drunk. So it's not a defense if you got drunk after your intent. It's not a defense if you're an alcoholic and addicted to drugs. Um, where will it work? Well, it'll work may be best if you take a drug which has a very rare or unknown side effect. Um, so you take, <clears throat> you know, an anti-ulcer medicine. Excuse me. <clears throat> you take an anti-ulcer medicine and it causes for you hallucinations and you um, injure someone during this. And so your defense might be, well, there is no warning label. It, this doesn't affect anybody. It only occurs one in a million times. Therefore, I'm involuntarily intoxicated. That might work. But notice in a DUI, right? In a DUI or in speeding, there's no intent. We don't have to say, did you in intend 
to drive drunk. We just say, were you driving drunk? So in North Carolina, if I pull you over and you have alcohol in your system, it's not a defense to say, well, yeah, I took this medicine and I didn't realize it was going to impair me. Uh, so let me give you a, an interesting example there to make that a little clearer. Uh, most of my students um, are usually below 21. The rule for drinking in North Carolina and driving is if you are under the age of 21, you can have no alcohol in your system. So basically, you have to have a 0000. zero, zero, zero. Um, for people over 21, the level of intoxication is 0.08. If you were going to drive to school, and you had a bad cough, and you drank some cough medicine, and unbeknownst to you, or because you didn't pay attention to the label, that cough medicine had alcohol in it, and you drink it, and the cop pulls you over, and you do a breathalyzer, and you blow 0 .001, right? You cannot say, well, this is involuntary. I didn't know that the NyQuil, I'm not sure NyQuil has alcohol in it, but let's say it does. I didn't know the NyQuil has alcohol in it. So I was involuntarily intoxicated when I was driving, not a defense, because drunk driving is a strict liability crime. Um, now, if there's a warning on a bottle or something, even for a non-strict liability crime, you're not going to be able to use uh, involuntary intoxication. Again, involuntary intoxication, pretty rare defense. Let's move on to duress. Um, duress, which can also be called coercion or compulsion, is a defense, but you have to prove it. And what is duress? It is an immediate fear of injury or death that compels you to commit an act you otherwise wouldn't have done that constitutes crime, or as I put there, an imminent fear of death or serious injury that forces you to commit a crime. Okay, so the first thing is the threat has to be reasonable. If you're being threatened by someone who never in any of your wildest dreams could carry out the crime, it's not duress. It doesn't exist unless it's a physical threat. So if I, let's suppose I have pictures of you, let's suppose you're married and I have pictures of you um, committing adultery and you are a bank clerk and I say look if I'm gonna come down to the bank tomorrow I'm gonna walk up to your teller line if you don't give me all the money in the cash register drawer I'm gonna tell your wife or your husband that you're having an affair and if you cooperate you do not have the defense that well I was under duress because duress is only physical it has to be I walk to the front of the teller line I take a gun out, I point it at you, and I say, give me the money. Um, also, duress is never a defense to homicide. You can't kill someone to preserve your own life if that person you're killing is innocent. Um, the most obvious type of duress is pointing a gun at someone and threatening to pull the trigger and demanding that they commit some act. Now the act they commit can't be, and I hate to ruin it if you all are Saw fans, the movie Saw. Uh, in that movie, <clears throat> people are threatened with their own deaths if they don't kill another innocent person. Well, you know, uh, if they do, they're guilty of homicide. Um, you can only use duress as a defense if it is immediate. It can't be, I'm coming over tomorrow to beat you up. If it is a physical threat, right? I'm going to beat you up, I'm going to shoot you, that they're capable of and that you believe exists. All the rest doesn't happen. All right, let's talk about necessity, <clears throat> which is a defense. Necessity is you commit an illegal act to avoid some greater harm or danger. Classic example. You're in the woods, there's a, fun, there's a sudden snowstorm, you're caught unaware, uh, you, you're going to freeze to death, and lo and behold, in front of you is a cabin. If you don't break into the cabin, and which is a trespass, which is a breaking and entering, right? If you don't break into the cabin, you're going to die. You can do that, and you're not chargeable. Typically, there's got to be five elements for duress, as, a, as, as excuse me, as necessity as a defense. You commit a crime to prevent bodily harm, death, or evil. It can't just be, wow, you know, I'm really kind of hungry. I could use a snack. Oh, look, that store is closed, but I'm hungry, so I'm going to break the window and take out the gummy bears. 
there can't be an adequate alternative. The new crime that you do can't be worse than the crime or danger you're avoiding. You have to believe reasonably that committing that crime is necessary, and you can't have created the danger in the first place. So if you break into a drugstore to get bandages to save someone who's bleeding to death, it's not a defense if you're the one who shot him. Necessity is pretty rare, but it, it does occur. I've seen it a few times. Now, obviously, one of the ones the next one is one of the most common ones we talk about, and that's alibi. Alibi says, um, I spelled prosecution wrong there. Uh, prosecution, that's an interesting one. Uh, alibi says, you can't prove beyond reasonable doubt that I committed the crime. In other words, you're presenting factual evidence that the prosecution is wrong. So one of the things you can argue is the crime didn't occur. You say I killed Fred. You have no evidence that Fred is dead. You, you can't produce a body. Um, so in a murder that the deceased is not dead is a defense, an alibi defense. Um, <clears throat> that you didn't commit all or any one of the elements of a crime. So if you're trying to charge me with um, assault on a female, inflicting or assault with a deadly weapon, inflicting serious injury, maybe that's a better one. If you can't show, if you can show that the person got beat up, but you can't show I used an object. If you, if all you've got evidence of is I hit him with my hands, um, that's not going to be assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury. So another example I gave there is the burglar is not committed at night. Now, one of the things about the alibi defense is technically, and I want to emphasize this, only technically, as a defense attorney, I don't have to prove innocence. It's the job of the prosecution to prove guilt. Oops, sorry. Um, I don't ever need to raise an alibi. The burden is on the prosecution to prove every element. Um, and they have to prove every element, the prosecution does, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, one of the things that North Carolina can do is North Carolina will say, well, if you're going to raise an alibi defense, if you're going to say, well, I didn't commit the robbery of the Piggly Wiggly or the convenience store because I was with my friends. Uh, North Carolina General Statute 15A905 says, if you're going to claim the alibi defense and you're going to use them as witnesses, your friends as witnesses, you got to tell us the friends' names. you got to tell us where this occurred. The only thing you don't have to do, though, if you say, I didn't do this and uh, I have a defense, <clears throat> but there's no other witnesses to it and there's no other physical evidence, I don't have to tell you that. The witness's own testimony or alibi does not have to be disclosed. So if you say, well, I wasn't there because I was someplace else to commit the crime, the robbery of the grocery store, um, and if your only evidence that you're someplace else is your testimony, I don't have to tell the police that. This actually can give a little bit of an advantage to the defense because essentially what you're saying is to the prosecution, I have a defense and I'm not going to tell you what it is. So the prosecution has to be at least a little worried, which is why as a defense attorney, it's best if your client, the defendant, has never made a statement of what happens to the police. Because if there's no statement, they can't look for a hole in the alibi. And when you get to trial, they're going to have to try to poke a hole not knowing what it is. Now, most of the time people have said, no, I wasn't there, or yeah, I knew him, or yeah, it was self-defense. Okay. The defense of following orders of another. The general rule is it is not a defense um, if you are just following orders from somebody else. However, Public officials can act on orders from other officials if they believe it is lawful. In fact, in North Carolina, um, it's a misdemeanor to willfully fail to follow law enforcement officers if those orders from that officer are lawful. So if a cop says, let's suppose you're standing on your property just, I don't know, sunbathing in the front yard, and a cop comes up and says, I don't want to see you sunbathing in your yard again. Go in the house. And you say, no. 
Um, it, that is not a violation of North Carolina law. You do not have to bathe that because you can be sunbathing. Now I'm assuming you're not nude or you know burning a campfire or doing something illegal. If you're just out there, um, that's not a crime. In fact, and do not, do not, do not, do not, do not do this. In North Carolina, you may re resist physically on unlawful arrest. Um, so in theory, let's suppose a police officer comes up to you and says, oh, it's you, Fred, and your name is not Fred, it's Bob. And you say, no, it's Bob. And he goes, no, you're Fred, and I'm going to arrest you. And he goes to take you into custody. Now, in theory, you could resist, and it would not be unlawful resisting arrest. Um, so, in theory, you could do it. Don't ever do it, because if there's any sort of charge or you're mistaken, you're going to add on to the charge. Better to get downtown and get it straightened out. All right, let's talk about double jeopardy. This, is a, uh, this begins to really touch on the constitutional areas. Double jeopardy only can be applied if you've, only, if you've already been convicted or acquitted of the same crime. So, quick example. In 1995, you get arrested for beating up your wife. Um, you are charged with uh, domestic assault. There's a trial, you're acquitted. Right? You are found not guilty. They don't believe the wife. 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, whatever, we find, or five years later, we find a videotape that clearly shows you beating up your wife. You're not going to have another trial. I don't care what evidence you find. If you have a trial and the person's found not guilty, then double jeopardy attaches, that's the word we use, and there's no more trials. Now, let's suppose I arrest you in 2024, this year. I put you on trial, um, and there's a mistrial. For whatever reason, one of the jurors gets sick, the, the, the prosecution gets sick, uh, there's an improper, there's something that goes on and the judge dismisses the case. Um, or it goes all the way to the end and the jury goes back in the room and they can't come up with a verdict. Double jeopardy has not attached. We can still, in both those cases, have a new trial. It doesn't apply if you're being tried for the same crime but different times. So let's suppose I was arrested for selling drugs in 2015 and I was convicted or acquitted doesn't matter and the trial went all the way and I was I was accused of say selling um, crack cocaine and then I'm arrested in 2024 and they charge me with the same crime I can't claim well you already convicted me of this once yeah but we're not charging you for what you did in 2015 we're charging you for what you did in 2024 therefore double jeopardy doesn't apply it does not apply if you're being charged for the same crime against the same individual if there's two different states or federal governments doing it too. So this is the last, but probably one of the rarest of the exceptions to double jeopardy. Let's suppose you kidnap someone in Wilmington, North Carolina. Now, for those of you not familiar with North Carolina and listening to this online, the next day south of North Carolina is South Carolina because we lack imagination and you drive from Wilmington, North Carolina with your kidnap victim to Charleston, South Carolina, which is south of Wilmington. You are arrested in North Carolina, you are tried for kidnapping, and you are acquitted. You are found not guilty. You might say, okay, double jeopardy attached. It does. North Carolina can't try you again. But guess what? The federal government could charge you. There is a federal kidnapping statute. You could be tried and you could be found guilty. South Carolina could try you because it's a different sovereign entity. The only thing Double Jeopardy does is it stops people from being tried twice by the same state, essentially. Let's go to the next one. Separate offenses, of course, can be divided in different ways. Uh, what do we mean by this? Um, <clears throat> typically, all crimes are composed of general elements and specific facts. So you could be charged with first degree arson of a church when you intentionally burn down a church on August 1st, 2022 in Rollsville, North Carolina. But, okay, um, let's suppose you burn down a different church. We can charge you, double jeopardy doesn't attach. Let's suppose you were acquitted 
uh, of the intentional arson, but we can show that um, a firefighter, firefighter died fighting the fire. Now we're going to charge you with uh, a manslaughter statute. We're going to say, well, we can't prove you intentionally killed someone. Um, so it wasn't an intentional arson. It wasn't a first degree arson, but it was an arson by negligence. You accidentally set the fire. You were there. You did set the fire, but you didn't do it intentionally. So there's no first degree arson charge, but you did it accidentally. And because that accidental death led to the death of a firefighter, we can charge you with the manslaughter. So it gets pretty complex here. We, we're getting pretty deep into the weeds. Now we're going to use two terms. I hesitate to go to these terms. These are both Latin terms, res judicata and collateral estoppel. Um, they're pretty technical, and uh, but we're, your, your book decided to go ahead, so we're going to go ahead and address them. So, in theory, res judicata um, claim precludes claims and collateral estoppel precludes issues. That's the difference between the two. So let's hit, look at res judicata first. Once a claim's been determined between two parties at trial, then for those two parties, you can't retry that fact. So here's the example. If in a case for the theft of a car between John Smith and Fred Doe, it was established that the car belonged to John Smith, then that is an established fact. And in future cases, the court has to respect that fact. Now, collateral estoppel, once you determine the central issue, you can be prevented from denying it in the future. If in the above case, it was decided there was a theft, that the car was stolen, then the two parties could be stopped from denying it in the future. So I was trying to think of an example of this today. And although I hesitate to do this, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Donald Trump was accused of sexual assault on Miss Carroll, and um, then he made some relatively improper comments about it. Okay, now regardless of whether it happened, so let's just set that aside because I, I don't. I'm not debating Donald Trump here. I'm debating a popular issue. So you understand, it is now established. Okay. Um, that we don't have to relitigate whether the offense occurred. Because one of the things the judge said to Donald Trump was, okay, this happened, you owe her damages. And in the future, you can't keep saying negative things about her. You basically have been found liable for the sexual assault. So res judicata applies. And they can be stopped from denying in the future that the assault occurred. And when they do deny it, when he did deny it, he was fined more money. So it, you know, I think it's up to, uh, what's it, $93 million that he owes her now? So basically, res judicata and collateral estoppel, they do happen, they're pretty rare. You're not gonna see them that often. Okay, let's, let's talk about something that's a little bit more common, a little bit less esoteric. Well, I've got a few more defenses to get through, and that's entrapment. I've got another one of my cartoons. Um, so entrapment is when the government, usually by a police officer acting, gets a person who doesn't want or intend to commit a crime to do it. So the classic example here is um, you're walking down the street and an attractive member of the, I'm going to assume you're heterosexual, an attractive member of the opposite sex comes up to you and says, you're very attractive, um, I'd like to have sex with you. And you say, wow, my lucky day, right? And the, and the person says, but, you know, uh, I want you to pay for the motel room and buy me a dinner. So essentially you are, uh, you know, paying for sex. And you say, well, okay, you know, that's, that's all right, I'll do that. And then you're arrested because it's an undercover agent for the police. So if you think about that, what happens is you were solicited right, to commit a crime um, and you didn't intend to sleep with anyone. You didn't intend to pay for a prostitute, but the police essentially went out and created uh, the crime. Often 
if you're going to use entrapment as a defense, um, it starts to veer in, did the person feel that he was in danger or was he coerced to do it? I was listening to a uh, podcast about uh, when the police, uh, I believe it was the FBI, had an undercover agent in, I want to say it's Colorado, in Colorado uh, infiltrated a Black Lives Matters group and they started talking about trying to get one of the members to agree to an assassination of the Colorado Attorney General or the Colorado District Attorney. They conflated and confused those two, two terms. And one of the defenses of this person when he kind of agreed to it was he was afraid the people doing it would hurt him if he didn't agree. So there has to be a thin line there. Um, most of the time it doesn't get that serious. Most of the time it's for more minor crimes. But let, let's talk a little bit about how North Carolina handles it. And then we're, we're pretty close to the end here. Okay. North Carolina defined entrapment, uh, um, the, the big one um, is a state versus Ott came down in 2014. The police confidential informant got Ott to sell drugs in return for a lighter sentence his own crime. The informants got the drug for Ott, told Ott what to say, and arranged for the police to make the buy. Um, this was entrapment, right? So um, the, the confidential informant goes to Ott and gets him to do this, and then the police provide the drugs. And then, you know, basically what you're doing is you're drumming up business. The two critical parts here is the act of persuasion or trickery or fraud by the law enforcement to get their agent, in this case it was an undercover police, undercover informant, to induce the defendant to commit a crime. He didn't want to do it, but the confidential informant got out to do it. And the informant actually got the drugs. Um, the, the criminal design originated in the minds of the government and not in the minds of an innocent defendant. Okay, so a couple more slides and we're done. Let's, let's talk about exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory evidence shows you did not commit the crime. Inculpatory evidence shows that you did. So as a defense attorney, I'm always looking for exculpatory evidence. As a prosecutor, I'd be looking for inculpatory. So exculpatory evidence comes in lots and lots of different forms. It can be the testimony. Hey, I've got a witness that says he wasn't at the robbery. It can be physical evidence. Hey, I've got a videotape that says he was 10 miles away. It could be logic. Hey, he's a millionaire. Why would he rob the Piggly Wiggly? It can be motive. Um, he had everything to lose and nothing to gain by committing the crimes. So sometimes you, you try to prove all these things. All right, the final thing to really talk about here, and I'll let you go, is statute of limitations. And I've got a picture there of uh, Bill Cosby. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it, it's a state-by-state -state action. And basically, Mr. Cosby was accused by numerous women of placing drugs in their drinks and then having sex with them. Raping them would be the term, okay? sex without consent. Um, and this rumor floated around for years and years and years, numerous people. The interesting thing was, by the time this bubbled up so that enough people came forward, uh, and there are numerous, numerous accusers, there were so many accusers um, that you know, I, I think it's reasonable to say something was happening, but the acts were committed in states that had statutes of limitations. And, you know, classically, um, three years, sometimes seven years, um, if you do not report a crime, if someone is not arrested for a crime or charged with that crime within this three years or seven years, you can't charge them. And this is what happened to Mr. Cosby, is that uh, there were all these accusations and almost all of them the statute of limitations was barred. Now, there was the one he was actually convicted of was, strangely enough, he was granted immunity if he, I mean, he didn't really want it, I don't think, but he was granted immunity if he agreed to provide information um, and they would not be charged. And he provided the information, and then I'm, I'm shorthanding this, and another DA said, well, I'm going to charge you. I didn't agree to that. And the court said, and he went to jail for a while. The court said on appeal, no, that's not going to work. He had, he had 
testimonial immunity and you can't use it against him. So final point here before I let you all go. How does North Carolina handle statute of limitations, which is a bar, not a defense? Because if you, once you show there's statute of limitations, there's no trial. Even though pretty clearly, I would say, Mr. Cosby uh, drugged and assaulted women, raped women, um, you can't charge him because he can raise that defense. Now, if he had committed that crime in North Carolina, here's an interesting fact. North Carolina has a statute of limitations for misdemeanors. If I slap someone on the street, if I kick a dog, both those misdemeanors. Um, if you do not bring me, if you do not charge me or bring me to trial within two years, then the statute of limitations is wrong. But for North Carolina, there is no statute of limitations for felonies. So basically, if you do not bring someone to trial for 10 years, 20 years in North Carolina, it doesn't matter. So if you're having Thanksgiving dinner with your family and your grandmother says, yeah, you know, back in the 50s, uh, me and Elvis, we, we robbed the liquor store together. You could actually turn your grandma in in North Carolina and she could be prosecuted if it could be proved that her and Elvis did this. It was not just a story. All right, well, on the note of Elvis Presley and your grandmother robbing a liquor store in North Carolina in the 1950s, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, next time when you're ready, um, you know, we'll move on to the next chapter. We're getting very close to starting to cover the homicides. Uh, we got a little bit more groundwork to lay, a little bit more North Carolina information to put down, but we're pretty close. So you all have a pleasant afternoon, evening, morning, if you're so inclined, and whenever you're ready, you can start the next chapter.